this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jogre 66 Hour of the Truth today. Once again in collaboration with uh, my brother Tom Fress from the United States of America. The Ministry Inquisition update, we are gathered here together via Skype to do the next, which is the 40th reading of the uh, reading and discussion actually, of the book from Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions. We have come uh, to about middle of the book. Uh, this is our third attempt to start a new chapter because all the other two attempts were addressed with other subjects that were also very much important and we didn't come to the reading. So maybe today uh, they say third time is a charm. We come to the reading of it. But uh, first, let me warmly welcome Brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update to the broadcast. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Hello, Yerk. It's nice to be here, and hello to the listeners. And I'm anxious to see what uh, Steve Wahlberg has to say. Yeah, me too. Um, we are in this chapter 17 called The Return of the Wounded Beast. And uh, we already read this page, and we read a part of the other page. So I'm going to continue on the second paragraph. Um, we came up to the third paragraph, but I'm going to continue on the second paragraph, as always here, just uh, for repetition's sake, to go a little bit back into the actual book. Huh? So let me just put the picture of the book reading here, and then we're going to go start reading. As always, there's a big difference between fact and fiction. The wounding of the beast is referred to four times in Revelation chapter 13, namely in verse 3, 10, 12, and 14. Yet notice, the beast, quote, was wounded by the sword and lived, unquote. Chapter 13, verse 14. Thus, his wound comes from the sword, not a pistol, rifle, or submachine gun. Revelation 13, verse 10 also reveals the additional insight that the wounding of the beast involves his going into captivity. Paul declared, 
quote, the sword of the Spirit, unquote, to be the word of God itself. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, where it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. He is speaking here of putting on the whole armor of God, that we are guarded against the fiery, um, uh, fiery, what's it called, um, of the devil, uh, arrows, fiery arrows of the devil. During Reformation times, it was this that quote-unquote wounded the papacy. As John Wycliffe, John Huss, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, John Calvin, John Wesley, and countless other spirit-filled reformers wielded the Bible's message about Jesus Christ and Antichrist, Papal Rome received a nearly fatal slash. Hundreds of thousands left the Roman Church, and Europe was shaken as with a mighty earthquake. The final blow against the weakened Roman system came in 1798 or 1866, when the army of Napoleon invaded the Vatican and took the Pope into exile. Now, even speaking about 1798 and 1866, which we did abundantly in previous broadcasts, that's why I'm not going to address that subject again here, is something that you can also have another point of view on. But that's something that we will address some 10 pages from here, because I was preparing the book. You know, I have to prepare the um, Bible quotations uh, that they are from the AV 611 King James Bible. And then I prepare the book a little bit, and here and there I come again, uh, I come across some things, and we will see that there is also another interpretation of Revelation, which is quite interesting and uh, gives us a reason to think about that and to study that deeply from a totally other point of view. But that's for when we come there on the page 112, 113 around about, and we are not there yet. So the final blow against the weakened Roman system came in 1798-1866, when the army of Napoleon invaded the Vatican and took the Pope into exile, or in 1866, when Garibaldi took away the temporal power of the Papal States. God's prophetic clock had set the year 1798 as the end of the Papal supremacy, and when the hour struck, the mighty ruler on the Tiber before whose anathemas the kings and emperors of Europe had so long trembled, yeah, think of uh, Henry IV, the German king in 1075, with his um, dispute he had with uh, Hildebrand, Pope Gregory VII, went into captivity and his government in the Papal States was abolished. You've heard the expression, you've come a long way, baby. This is especially true when it comes to prophetic interpretation. Best-selling books and blockbusters, a uh, blockbuster Christian movies, and we should put Christian in this regard, of course, in quotation marks, now apply Revelation's prophecy about a beast that receives a deadly wound to some fictitious Mr. Deception like Nikolai Carpathia, who is assassinated after a secret rapture. This is all like a house of illusion at an amusement park. The truth is, the Bible says the beast, which represents a kingdom in Daniel chapter 7 verse 23, would be quote-unquote wounded by the sword, as we read in Revelation chapter 13 verse 14, and go unquote unquote into captivity, Revelation chapter 13 verse 10. The Reformation did wound the papal power with heaven's razor-sharp sword of the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And finally, Rome's leader went into captivity into France. Yeah? But the papal states were not taken away as they in 1866-1870, and that was the real loss of temporal power. We spoke about that, and I give you also a link to Wikipedia that you can research that for yourself. This papal downfall took the place uh, took place on February 10, 1798, exactly at the end of 1,203 score years predicted in Scripture. As Paul Harvey so often says, we need to hear quote the rest of the story unquote. The prophecies about the little horn and the beast do not stop with the 1,203 score year period. 
the deadly wound by the sword, or the beast's captivity. No, there's more. In words of deep significance, scripture predicts, quote, his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Unquote. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Is this happening now? Well, the author says there's no question about it. The former deadly wound inflicted upon paper Rome now hardly needs a band-aid. With over a billion members, I think it's close to a billion and a half at least, the Vatican is now the headquarters of the most powerful religious organization on earth. In spite of horrendous sex scandals which have embarrassed the Roman Church when the Pope addresses America or the United Nations, the global community listens. And the global community does not only listen, it bows to his commands. In 1990, 16, books, 16 book best-selling author Malachi Martin published his fascinating work, The Keys of This Blood. The struggle for world dominion between Pope John Paul II, Mikhail Gorbachev and the capitalist West. Before his death in 1999, Martin was not only a highly esteemed former professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute of the Vatican, but also a nationally sought-after radio and TV guest on Vatican affairs. The Washington Post even referred to his uncanny accuracy and insights. In his 1990 book, The Keys of This Blood, and let me just uh, put a picture of that book in here. And in the meantime, Tom, of course, can give a comment if ever he wants to for the things that I read so far. Well, certainly I have a comment. Uh, I, I could have commented earlier when it was a little bit more appropriate, but uh, notice what we've just read is the account of uh, the receiving the the, uh, the beast receiving a mortal wound. Now, always in the futurist churches, uh, we are taught to believe that this mortal wound uh, it takes place after you know the, they they sign a seven year peace treaty with the Jews. The Antichrist signs a seven year peace treaty with the Jews. Uh, to uh, allow them to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again. And then after three and a half years, this Antichrist, this, uh, according to the Left Behind series book, uh, this Carpathia, this Nikolai Carpathia, causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And at some point, after causing the Temple Mount worship to stop, uh, he receives a mortal wound. Uh, during a 1260-day period of of days, and uh, this is how the Vatican, uh, together with her harlot daughters, for lack of a better description, are painting a, a futurist picture of what took place long ago in history. Yeah, Tom, that is. That, that is, sorry, sorry to interrupt you here, this is the point we addressed already earlier and it is very interesting that you bring that up again. Yeah. They, mix, they mix the complete fulfillment of the 70th week by Jesus Christ in the 70th week, which is two times 1,203 score days, three and a half years, makes two times seven years. They mix these real seven years, earthly years, with the prophetic years of 1,203 score days and prophecy, which speaks of 1,203 score actual years. And they mix yeah. that up and they can only mix that up because people don't read their Bible and are confused when three and a half years mentioned here and they are literal and three and a half years mentioned here and they are mentioned spiritually. They don't make the distinction anymore. That's how they are so easily betrayed. I think that's a very important point you make and it is uh, it is sure to be made once again. Let me put the picture here of uh, 
Jesus fulfilling the 70th week of Daniel. When we see here the 70th week, the last week after the 69 weeks, you know, this uh -huh. blue bridge, this is one week, one week, seven years is 2,520 days. The midst of that, when Jesus went to the cross, is 1,203 score days. But that is literal days. That was Jesus yeah. Christ's ministry on earth. And they take this 70th week, and especially the first part, the first 2000, uh, 1,260 days, and change that with the prophetical 1,260 days of Daniel chapter 7 and of the book of Revelation. That's such an important point you are making there, Tom. I don't want you go. I don't want you to go easily over that because that really is something that has to be drummed in with many people. I think. Look, it's uh, it's it's a very complicated thing that they're trying to paint. Uh, uh, they're trying to use the prophecy of Daniel to justify a future fulfillment. And. Uh, uh, it, it to people who are just coming to this, it, it might seem tremendously complicated and uh, confusing. But uh, look, we're only confused because our pastors have allowed us to believe a lie. Okay? There is no such thing as a future fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. It was ful fulfilled by Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince. The prince that shall come 2,000 years ago. Now, every time we begin to get a little bit confused by this futurist nonsense that we're receiving from the pulpits of our churches, we have to remember all the time they're talking about a future fulfillment. There's no such thing. We can only understand this if we protect our minds from mixing historicism and futurism, which is a tendency that I've seen even in my own life when God was trying to bring me out of futurism and bring me into, fu in, into historicism, I found myself at various stages having one foot in historicism and, another foot, and the other foot still in futurism. And so the confusion continued and continued and continued and little by little, uh, the, the Lord answered all my questions and satisfied all, all, the, uh, all the questions and cleared my mind about these confusing things. And uh, Satan wants a, a, a believable redo of Daniel's 70th week. He wants it in the future so as to present to the world a false messiah the the real 70th week of daniel was about nothing but jesus the christ okay there was no mention directly or indirectly of any antichrist it was all about jesus daniel spoke in in daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 27 daniel never spoke at all about the antichrist it's all about jesus but in the futurist scenario, the last seven years that the world wants us to believe in, that the papacy wants us to believe in, uh, the Antichrist fulfills it. Okay? And this is the one that supposedly uh, receives a, a mortal wound. After 1260 years, or 1260 days, after causing the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Actually, Tom, another mockery of Jesus Christ. Because Absolutely. Jesus Christ received a deadly wound when he was on the cross. Right. He died. He was dead for three days. Then he and resurrected and went up to yeah. heaven. And yeah. they are replaying that he, quote unquote, receives a, quote unquote, deadly wound, which is not deadly and resurrects. And thereby, they actually make him Christ, more or less. That's right. That's right. That's what it's all about. The enthronement of Satan in the world. And since Satan is a spirit, okay, since Satan is a spirit, he has to be, he has to be enthroned in a physical body. 
and that physical body is the papacy. Remember, Martin Luther said the papacy was nothing but a mask behind which Satan resides. Martin Luther was absolutely correct about that. The physical manifestation of Satan in the world is the papacy. Okay? The son of perdition is the papacy. Betrays Christ with a kiss. And uh, the papacy is the mask behind which Satan rules and reigns in this world. Now, since Satan is a spirit, uh, he has to have a physical a visible, physical manifestation in the world because he rules over a physical, visible kingdom, the kingdom of this world. And uh, the visible manifestation of Satan in the world is the Pope. And he intends to rule as if he were God on earth. And that's always been the claim of the papacy. The papacy is to be worshipped and obeyed as if he were Christ on earth. All right, That's Satan's demand. That was what Satan intended to do, to, work, to rule all the kingdoms of this world. First, he tried to give that physical manifestation to Jesus in, 40, in his 40 days of temptation, and when Jesus rejected it, that left Satan uh, with only one other opportunity. And that is to find a physical replacement for Jesus. Jesus was going back to his father. Okay? Jesus is ultimately going to rule and reign in this world. But Satan's going to have his shot. Satan is going to have his day. And his day is is being manifested in the world through the papacy. And, uh, and so the 70th week of Daniel, the future interpretation, is designed to put the onus of Antichrist onto someone else, whoever signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. And then, and then once he causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, he'll receive a, a mortal wound. And it's going to appear, appear to all the world as to be a perfect fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And the whole world's going to be looking at people like you and me and thinking, they were liars, they were deceivers. But when they do, they'll simply be denying that Jesus was the Christ because Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel right after the 69th week, 2,000 years ago. It's fulfilled and the deception takes place from that day forward. All throughout the Christian era, the papacy has been gathering strength. The papacy has been gathering power. The papacy has been gathering uh, membership to his church, political power, military power, financial power, human resources power, spiritual power from Satan, and it's ready to culminate into, into a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, the purpose of which is to ultimately present to the world a false Messiah. The true Messiah was revealed to the world, as Daniel predicted 2,000 years ago, in the historical 70th week of Daniel. The real 70th week of Daniel the Vatican's future interpretation is to present to the, to the world a false antichrist and then the papacy as the Christ. And so the future 70th week of Daniel has to be believable. It has to be, it has to be, it has to unfold in the world as close to uh, the original, the true 70th week of Daniel, as to keep the whole world deceived and confused. And the world is going to remain confused. The futurists are not going to repent. Okay? I don't see any, act, I don't see any movement to, uh, to uh, 
uh, abandon this futurist delusion. Um, but but we're, it's hopeful or we wouldn't be on the air preaching the truth. They have to have a hearing. They have to hear the truth. They have to make a decision, an informed decision. Which 70th week do they believe in? The historicist one that was fulfilled by Messiah the Prince or the futurist one that's going to be fulfilled by the Antichrist, by the papacy? Which Christ are they going to serve, Jesus or the vicar of Christ, the papacy? That's the decision. And uh, they don't get it yet. They don't want to get it because they'll have to give up on the rapture. They'll have to give up on that be- that wonderful double chocolate cake with all that juicy chocolate frosting on top of it, the rapture, the rapture frosting. But when they re- realize the truth, they'll be free in Jesus. No more, no more deception from Satan. They won't be deceived any longer. And uh, they've just got to make up their mind who they're going to serve. They're going to make up their mind if they, lo- if they want sanity or if they want delusion. Okay? Make-believe doesn't last very long. When the vision is over, the truth is over. But if you believe the truth, it lasts forever. That's like the kingdom of this world compared to the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of this world is temporary. The kingdom of Christ is forever. And futurism is temporary. At some point, the world is going to have to admit futurism is wrong. Once futurism runs its course, and the whole futurist scenario runs its course and is fulfilled in front of the very eyes and the cameras of the world. And the papacy rides into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass. Then people are going to realize they've been deceived. And people like you and me were telling the truth the whole time. They're going to say historicism's correct. They won't have any opportunity, any choice. And uh, some of them, absolutely those who are irretrievably deceived, are going to worship the papacy. They're going to obey the papacy just like they do now. And uh, But God's people's eyes are going to be opened. Those that have eyes to see and ears to hear are going to see. The greatest deception since the Garden of Eden has just ful- just unfolded before their very eyes, and now they can see the difference. And uh, I hope and pray that all of our work and effort over the years contributes to their return to the truth. It's going to take time. It's going to take repetition. We're going to have to answer a whole lot of questions, and uh, but be persistent and uh, be available and uh, pray, 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 pray. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. That's exactly what we needed to hear right now. So, going to continue in the book. (coughs) Sorry. In his 1990 The Keys of This Blood book, Malachi Martin suggested that in his time there were only three powers capable of ruling the world. Russia, America and the Vatican. Of those three, Martin predicted that the Roman Church would win the struggle over, quote, who will hold and wield the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us as a, F, F, over all of us together as a community. Over the entire six billion people expected by demographers to inhabit the earth by early in the third millennium, unquote. Along with the Pope himself, Martin upheld, quote, the papacy as the ultimate arbiter for problems and dilemmas affecting nations all over the globe, unquote, because it alone is the mother of all men's souls. At the beginning of the keys, Martin glanced back, quote, 1500 years and more, unquote, when, quote, 
Rome kept as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the wide world. Unquote. Then he significantly, significantly referred to quote, 200 years of inactivity, unquote, which had been, quote, been imposed on the papacy by the major secular powers of the world. Unquote. Now, do you realize the significance of this? Counting back 200 years from 1990 takes us to 1790, only eight years away from the inflicting of the wound. True to history, Martin looks back to the 19th century when, quote, Pius VI and Pius VII left Rome, but only because they were kidnapped by French governments and imprisoned on French soil. Unquote. Precisely. Unconscious. Unconscious of the prophetic connection, Martin continued by saying that after some 200 years of official non-existence, the distinguishing mark of John Paul's career as pontiff has been to throw off the straitjacket of papal activity in major world affairs. Malachi boasted of the Slavic Pope, in quotation marks, who has, quote, a new eye toward a purpose that is as old as the papacy itself, an eye that was not merely international, but truly global. Unquote. The basic message of the keys of this blood is, quote, Papal Rome is back, the wound is healing, and the Vatican's goal is world dominion. Unquote. There's your new world order right there. Which is nothing else but the old world order restored. That's right. Whether the papacy ever achieves this or not, Bible prophecy does predict Rome's return to power and resurrected global influence. It is a fact. In our 21st century, there is no president, no statesman, or even a rock and roll singer, including Mick Jagger, Michael Jackson, Madonna, or Britney Spears, who can gather a larger crowd than the Pope. In 1995, the front cover of Time magazine labeled Pope John Paul II its Man of the Year. Unquote. And I have a picture of that, I think, here. Man of the... Oops. Let me just look that up. Man of the Year. And while you're looking that up, I'll explain to the listeners how it's even possible that the Pope has regained all that power. Class, one more time. It's because Protestantism... Mainstream Bible Christianity no more holds to the Protestant planks. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. They preach that Jesus is the Christ, but they say the Antichrist is future. That's the difference. The Protestant Reformation liberated the whole world from the papacy's temporal and spiritual control. But after futurism had done its deed, for 200 years being preached consistently from all the pulpits and all the Protestant and evangelical churches, Protestantism, the only resistance to the rise of the man of sin, was taken out of the way. Okay? You might view the Protestant Reformation as the great, the great uh, restrainer, all right? And now that Protestantism is dead, being no longer a protest against the man of sin in Rome, the papacy has restored to itself all the power, all the influence, all the control, all the wealth, that the papacy enjoyed during the Dark Ages, where the popes ruled over the kings of the world and every man, woman, and child was made a subject of the Roman Catholic uh, Church, a subject of the Holy Roman Pontiff. That's the old world order. And the new world order is simply the old world order restored on a global scale, okay? The only possible way that this could happen is as if Protestantism was destroyed. 
and it's happening. It's in your face. The papacy is now declaring a global new world order. And by that, you can only conclude that Protestantism is dead. And it's dead because it took the lethal poison called futurism. And now we're all going to be slaves, forced into subservience to the man of sin in Rome. He's got control of the financial institutions of the world. He controls the money. He controls the goods. He controls the, the, uh, the markets. He controls it all. He's going to take us by force. You won't be able to buy or sell unless you serve him. You worship and obey the man of sin in Rome. That's what this is all boiling down to. And they prepared Jerusalem, Temple Mount, for his eventual reign there on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem as if he were God on earth. Now, how far God will allow this delusion to continue, I don't know. To what, to what extent will this phony future 70th week of Daniel be allowed to progress? Only God knows. But what's important to me is to make sure everyone's prepared and no one's deceived. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. And whoever rules and reigns on Temple Mount in Jerusalem is going to be the papacy. All right? That's been the whole design from the very beginning, that Satan exalt his throne above the stars of God to ascend above the heights of the clouds to be like the Most High. Now, Satan attempted to do that with Jesus when he, was tempt when he tempted him in the desert. He wanted Jesus to be his vicar on the earth. And through Jesus, Satan had hoped to rule and reign in this world and to fulfill his prophecy of exalting his throne above the stars of God. But Jesus rejected his offer. And what you've not been told in your churches is that Satan immediately found another candidate for that role. It was only a few hundred years later that Satan made the same offer to the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church, and he accepted that role. And he's been prospering and practicing in that role ever since. All throughout the Christian era, Antichrist has been with us, persecuting the saints, martyring the saints, to the degree that he's drunk, drunk, inebriated with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And if you're looking for a future Antichrist, you are completely out of, out of, out of, you're out of contention for any hope. All right? You've been so wickedly deceived, so hopelessly and helplessly deceived, that you couldn't find your backside with both hands. And how can I say it? Because I was one. I was deceived like everybody else. But now I know the truth. And I want to help you see the truth. Yerk wants to help you see the truth. Steve Wolberg wants to help you see the truth. And the truth is far more believable than the wicked futurist lies that we've been told all of our lives. And because we fell for that deception, the Pope now rules us morning, noon, and night. And once again controls all the governments of the world. Is there going to be another Protestant Reformation to liberate us all again? I don't think man has the will. I don't think man has the spiritual power to do it. It's going to require the return of Jesus Christ to set this straight. 
And when he returns, what will he find us doing? Worshiping him in spirit and in truth? Or worshiping the man of sin in Rome? Obeying all of his antichrist laws? Worshiping and fawning at the feet of the man of sin in Rome? I'm telling you, if you stay in your churches, that's where you're going to be found when Christ returns. Worshiping at the feet of the man of sin in Rome. That's where the churches are taking everybody. This is a serious issue. This is the most serious discussion a man can have in our generation. Are we going to believe in the future 70th week of Daniel? Are we going to believe in the historical fulfillment by Christ 2,000 years ago? I think the answer should be far more easy to make than most people are making it. I hope and pray I helping you understand what is really going on in this world. Back to you, Yerk. Jesus had his reasons, Tom, when he asked the question, when I come back, will I find faith in the world? That's right, he what sure did. What faith did he refer to? The faith that he was the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. That's right. Well, as you see, I didn't find a cover of the 1995, which is here on uh, Google. I just looked it up because I don't have it on my computer. This is from December 26, 1994 and January 1995, the front cover that you see. I only had one of Pope Francis, the actual Pope, who also was called quote-unquote person of the year a few years ago. Now, the author continues to say that in the article in the Time magazine, it is quoted when he talks, it is not only to his flock of nearly a billion, he expects the world to listen. And the flock and the world listen. <laughs> I think this is a very interesting sentence. When he talks, it is not only to his flock of nearly a billion that he talks to, but it is the whole of the world that he expects to listen. Why does he expect the whole world to listen to him, Tom? Because in Revelation chapter 13 it is written, and the whole world wandered after the beast. Sure. So the whole world listens to him. Yeah, we are all made Catholic, even without our consent or our knowledge. As uh, Richard Bennett put it so boldly in his video, Vatican control through civil law. That's and that's right. why the whole world listens. Whether you are a church goer into the Roman Catholic Church or you're not, he does not care. He expects the whole world to listen. He addresses to quote unquote his flock. He addresses to quote unquote his church. But he expects the whole world to listen. And the flock and the whole world. Listen. No doubt you have heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They were magnificent structures, colossal monuments. One was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Another, the Great Pyramid of Giza. In our modern times, people stand amazed at the developments of technology. Computers, the internet, satellite communications, fiber optics and stem cell research. Yet, there is another quote-unquote wonder predicted in Revelation which also applies to our 21st century world. It's the wonder of a wounded beast now healing. The Holy Bible says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Have Protestants lost their swords? Why don't they discern the fulfillment of prophecy? Because there are no Protestants anymore, but they are waiting 
for Nikolai Carpathia. That's right. They're waiting for a false antichrist. They're waiting for a false, phony refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. The whole world is a stage for the 70th week of Daniel. The futurist 70th week of Daniel. The papacy has control of the whole world. The papacy has control of what goes on in, in uh, Israel, in Jerusalem, and, and Temple Mount. And uh, as soon as uh, God takes his hand off, I believe Satan's going to be able to uh, go all the way with this phony future 70th week. I think he's going to be given his day. It's just like Jesus said to uh, the son of perdition that betrayed him with a kiss 2,000 years ago. He looked at Judas and he said, what thou must do, do quickly. And that son of perdition was allowed to do everything that the prophecies pre predicted that he would do. He sold Christ for the price of a slave. And I believe the future Antichrist is going to get to do everything that he was prophesied to do. I think the only thing out of his control is the timing of it. I think ever since 1948, when Israel became a modern nation state and the Jews were given their, supposedly given their homeland back, I think God has had his hand on the whole thing, pre uh, pre preventing it from being fulfilled too soon. Hopefully giving God's people a chance to realize just what a deception they bought. So give them time to repent. Give them time to, to comprehend the wickedness of this future phony 70th week and to come out of it to repent of it to return to the historical fulfillment of it and to help turn the world away from the papal conquest of the world and uh but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I think some are going to repent. Some are going to turn away from this future deception and return to the truth. There are a few in this world that are not going to be deceived. But for the most part, the whole world is going to be deceived. And the only reason God is holding his hand on this and preventing the, the fulfillment of this phony future 70th week of Daniel is to give time for God's people, the elect of God, to repent of their error, repent of their futurist lies and deceptions, repent of their futurist sin in hoping for some escape when the Bible doesn't even predict an escape. We're going to see with our own eyes the destruction of the wicked when the tares are removed from the wheat. Noah did not rapture out. He survived the flood. He heard the waves and the wind and the rain. He was tossed up and down and back and forth in the boat with everybody else. He was subjected to five months of darkness, total darkness and rain and clouds and thunder and lightning. He was in the world, not out of the world when the judgment came. And that's going to be our lot, too. The rapture is a lie. The rapture is only attached to futurism so you won't spit it out of your mouth. That rapture is so sweet that you would rather eat the poison than spit out the frosting. 
And you've got to come to your senses. You've got to give up on a false hope and return to the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. Let's go continue in chapter 18 of the book, which is called The ID of Antichrist. It looks like a duck, or if it looks like a duck, sorry, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, we have at least to consider the possibility that we have a small aquatic bird of the family Anatidae on our hands. This is a quote from Douglas Noel Adams. The Bible is the measure of all truth, I say. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And when those things were so, well, then a duck is a duck, right? That's also what they learned in Berea, which this chapter 17, verse 11 of the book of Acts is talking about. Each time I travel overseas, I always carry my passport so I can identify myself before local government officials. After comparing my face with the photo, they know it's me. In America, my driver's license serves the same purpose. It lists my name, birth date, height, hair color and current address. These details are not so much for information, but for identification. That's the issue. In addition to the other puzzles we've found so far, the Bible gives us another highly practical clue to help us identify that which is truly Antichrist. Note this carefully from 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, quote, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard, that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, the denial that Jesus Christ was the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70 week prophecy is to say that Jesus is not come in the flesh, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. So every futurist has the spirit of Antichrist, whether he knows it or he doesn't. But that's the point that Tom over and over makes, professing Christ out of one side out of your mouth and out of the other you rightly deny him. But again, John wrote in 2 John uh, 1, 7, quote, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And I think it is also interesting, Tom, that we make maybe the distinction here, because in this sentence, in, in this verse, it comes very clear there is a difference between people who have the spirit of Antichrist and the Antichrist of scripture, prophecy and history, meaning um, the papacy. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So when you are filled with the spirit of not the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of Antichrist, then you are a deceiver and you are an Antichrist. Right. But that doesn't make you the Antichrist that is the papacy. That's right. There are many people who say, oh, but there are so many Antichrists. And the Bible even says, oh, there are many Antichrists even now in the world. Yes, there are. Those are the people that are in the spirit of Antichrist, the people that um, confess not that Jesus is the Christ, because if you do not confess that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus has come in the flesh, then you have the spirit of Antichrist. That is already in the world, but that doesn't speak of the son of perdition, the man of sin, the little horn, the Antichrist of the Bible. 
That's a very important distinction we have to make. And I think, Tom, that is such an important point that I want to give you the floor for the resting, resting 10 minutes or something of this video, that you can make that point very, very clear that we should never, ever mix that up. Everybody who does not have the Holy Spirit has another spirit, and that other spirit denies that Jesus is the Christ and confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That is also a person that is led by the spirit of Antichrist, but that doesn't make him the quote-unquote even bad man of um, the futurist deception. Yeah. Well, there have... As we all know, many there have been many deceivers in the world. The Bible talks about some of the deceivers by name. In the New Testament, it mentions Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer, and, uh, and also Hymenaeus and Philetus are specifically named. And uh, all of the, the names in the Old Testament, like Pharaoh, Haman, uh, they were all types of the eventual papal archetype. Everything that you see in those characters are all found all at once, all together in the papacy. And uh, so the we're not talking about the types. We're talking about the global archetype, the papacy. That is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one that Daniel prophesied, the one that Paul prophesied, the one that John prophesied. And all the wickedness named in all the Bible are found in that one single institution. And it's a dynasty. It's an office. It's not one that, uh, that only lives the life of a single man. It, it's a dynasty of popes that hold an, a perpetual office and fulfill a perpetual prophetic role in the world. Pharaoh's dead. Haman's dead. Simon Magus is dead. Hymenaeus and Philetus is dead. But the papacy lives forever. Okay? So that's the difference between antichrists many and the antichrist one and so uh, it, there's no reason for anybody to be deceived by this there's no reason for anybody to be confused by this i've just made to you the simple distinction that explains and answers all the questions about the antichrist Yes, there are many people that have the spirit of Antichrist who contribute to the Antichrist spirit in this world. But there's only one institution in the whole history of the world that perpetuates everything that's found in all of these little Antichrists all throughout history. And this was the great, uh, this was the great discovery of all the Protestant reformers. This isn't something Tom Fress made up. You, you know, I don't talk about anything that's new. Nothing that I talk about is new. Everything I talk about is ancient. It's as old as Christianity itself. The things I talk about were believed by Christians all the way back to the first century. It's called biblical Christianity true biblical Christianity. It only got, it only received upon itself the name of Protestantism when these truths were finally understood by a vast majority of Catholics who protested the papacy and came out of the Roman Catholic Church, recognizing that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy the great antithesis of Christ, the great counterfeit of Christ, the one who betrays Christ with a kiss, 
He looks for all the world to be a Christian, but he is the greatest enemy of Christ. That applies to only one institution in the whole history of the world. Nothing else even comes close. Nothing else is even mentionable. And you've been made to forget the longest held belief in true biblical Christianity. You've been taught lies that have, repla that have replaced the longest held belief in the Christian world. You see, it's, it's practically unbelievable that anyone today believes futurism. That you can go anywhere you want, any city in this country, around the world, and ask somebody who professes to be a Christian, do you know who the Antichrist is? And shockingly, they answer, no. Or they'll name an Antichrist, and everyone you talk to names a different one, making it plainly obvious they don't have a clue who the Antichrist was. Do you realize that never was the case in the entire Christian era? True Bible-believing Christians could always, without hesitation, without taking a breath, could tell you precisely who the Antichrist was. And if they could see and hear the futurist nonsense that is taught in the Protestant churches today, well, I'm, I'm, a, I, I just, I don't believe they'd, they'd even believe their eyes and ears. What is taught in the church today? Futurism was never heard of in the world, not in the Protestant world, until about 1805 or 1810. Somewhere in that area. And it is inexplicable why God's people, once hearing the historicist truth, don't immediately abandon the futurist deception and return to the truth. The power of deception, the subtlety of Satan and his vicar in Rome, is unbelievably powerful. But Christ is more powerful. The truth is more powerful. We just got to make sure everybody has a chance to hear the truth before they make up their minds. And you can help. It's your spiritual bounden duty and responsibility to help. That's your commission. You want God to use you? You want to be a warrior? in the kingdom of Christ, tell the truth about futurism. Show people how a, dis, dis, a childish a lie that it is. Help to restore the historicist understanding and the historicist fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And prove by scripture, by history, and by prophecy not to mention common sense, that futurism is the most childish load of hooey the world has ever heard. I'll see you next week. the great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders and their idea about one generational responsibility one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages, for the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, 
and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue. To move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda.